Hi, welcome to valuationpodcast.com, a podcast and video series about all things related to business and valuation. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I provide online divorce mediation and valuation services in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, we will discuss growing the value of your business. And all of this is from a business owner and value growth consultant perspectives with Garth Tebay. Garth is a practicing certified public accountant, a certified valuation analyst, a master analyst in financial forensics, and certified in mergers and acquisitions analyst with over 46 years of experience. He's the founder and managing partner of Value Defined, a business valuation and litigation support firm in Toledo, Ohio, and an affiliate member of Business Growth Alliance, which provides value growth consulting and investment banking services to owners of medium-sized businesses. Welcome, Garth. How are you? Good, Melissa. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, this is awesome. We're going to talk about something that business owners always want to know about, which is how to grow the value of your business. And I think it's interesting that you're going to give a little bit different perspective. But in general, how does a business owner increase the value of their business? So, Melissa, the whole process sort of starts with an assessment um, and with a consultant that helps the business owner walk through the process. Uh, the assessment starts with an interview of the owner and management. And there's a few prerequisites, uh, Melissa, that are um, really important um, in order for this to this process to work. And that is that the business owner has to have a willingness to change and a commitment to the process. So it's, um, you know, it's going to be a little different than what maybe the business owner and the consultant have done in the past. And uh, so there, there really needs to be a cooperation uh, at the, at the company level. They, after the interview and uh, goals and objectives are established, then there's a financial analysis that the consultant will do with management. Um, I'd like to do a valuation, not only as of the date that um, we're starting the engagement, but also the past five years. So what's important to understand is we need to identify whether or not the value of the business is increasing or is it decreasing. That gives us a benchmark. It gives us an idea of where we're starting from and whether, and it's also going to change how we view the objectives. Uh, the next part of the assessment process is to identify the value drivers um, and then prioritize those opportunities for value growth. Once we've identified the value drivers, the, uh, the goals and objectives, then we develop a plan and establish the objectives so we can implement. This is, um, Melissa, there is a, an enormous opportunity for business valuators uh, to start to use their skills and their training to be able to help business owners grow the value of their businesses. Um, too often, business owners spend 100% of their time with day-to-day -day issues, and they really don't devote any time at all as to what's the value of their business. And, um, and it's usually, Melissa, the biggest asset they have in their net worth. And when you think about it, um, spending a little bit of time each month um, uh, and a little bit of time once a year to evaluate where the business is at, what, what is it worth, and is it increasing or decreasing, could make the difference between uh, being able to um, generate an adequate return uh, and to be able to retire in the lifestyle that they're usually accustomed to. So um, this is not a short-term process. This is a fairly long-term process. And so the more time we have, uh, the more opportunity we have to increase the value. From a consultant standpoint, unbelievable opportunity to take those skills, 
that that they've learned over years re-engineer the skills so that they can turn those into um, uh, skills that increase the value of their clients' business. So, Melissa, this this is a tremendous opportunity for the business owner and also the valuation expert uh, from a from a business owner's point of view. Um, many of the small business owners are looking for a way that they could transition um, their business to either the next generation or um, their key employees or, or selling the business to um, a, another buyer or possibly even merging the business with a bigger concern. And um, many of the um, owners of small businesses have reached a, a point in their career where they need to convert this asset into liquidity, into cash and, and investments. And um, it, it's really an opportunity to maximize that value. And, and the more time we have as advisors, uh, the greater we can increase that value for the business owner. So this is an enormous opportunity and it's not a short term pro process. If we have five years, um, you know, we're going to have a, a much better opportunity to increase the value. Three years, we still can do quite a bit. If we have to shorten that down to one or two years, obviously uh, we're not going to have as big of an impact. But this is um, this is one of those things that business owners should should think seriously of getting started now. Um, it's probably the biggest asset they have in their net worth. And it's probably an asset that they don't know what the value of it is. They don't know if it's increasing or decreasing. And uh, they have no way of monitoring the value going forward. Uh, this process establishes all of those tools in place and starts to look at what do we what can we do to make it much greater so that when the business owner um, transfers the business that they're going to realize the largest amount as possible from the sale from a consultant's viewpoint evaluation expert this is enormous opportunity to take the skills that that they've learned over time the experience they have re-engineer those skills so that they can take those skills and use them to grow value in a business. And every one of us have been taught how to value a business. If we can then take those value drivers, reverse engineer that, we can certainly start to, to work with business owners on how to increase the value. It's a, it's a natural process. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a golden opportunity for both sides of this to be able to have uh, success in accomplishing their goals. Well, and let's just clarify something because I think that business owners in general, um, when we, you know, you and I do a ton of valuations every year and most of the time, even sophisticated businesses, even 10 million, 50 million in revenue, sometimes they haven't looked at historically what a five-year, three-year period looks like. And right. so for business owners, like you're not alone. Most people are not doing this in-depth analysis. They right. just kind of simply think, oh, I'll just increase revenues or cut expenses. But pulling somebody in that's a third party is going to be able to see it a little bit more easily. You know, you're like too far in the business that somebody coming in is like, oh, did you ever consider this? And you're like, oh, no, that's a great idea. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but right. you also, um, some of the process um, through this is that there are tools and a process that you can identify where the opportunities for improvements are or track the progress of somebody doing this over the course of time. Can you give us a little bit more of an idea of what that looks like in your opinion? Yeah, there's, there's, two tools that I'd like to <clears throat> introduce to the group, both from the 
business owner standpoint, as well as the uh, valuation consultants uh, standpoint. The first one's called Core Value Advisor Software. <clears throat> and this particular package is, is phenomenal. I mean, it, it's, it, it'll blow your mind. And what it does is it uses best practice methodologies to accurately assess <coughs> the opportunities for increasing value. I apologize for this cold I've got. So if I hack my way through this, it, um, I do apologize. It, it is what's, what's interesting about core value is it engages the business owner at the onset. And so the business owner is actually uh, identifying through a series of questions um, what the issues are within their company. And the software will take those particular assessments. It's called a discover module. And it will convert those into a valuation gap. So in other words, it'll, it'll, it'll say that uh, cash flow happens to be one of the value drivers that's been identified in the assessment and that that particular driver has a valuation gap between where the value should be and the, where the value is currently of a million dollars. And uh, it, the software will prioritize uh, the various opportunities for increasing the value. Uh, there's 18 value drivers that are built into the core value advisory software. Um, the, the first step, which I indicated is the discovery module. It's an, it's an absolute, excellent assessment presentation. It'll take the business owner about 30 minutes, maybe outside 45 minutes to fill out the questionnaire. Uh, it's really quite easy. And then they will immediately get uh, in, uh, um, results, outcome results of that particular questionnaire prioritizing those particular value drivers as well as how much value is assigned to each one of those drivers as far as the value gap. The next phase in the, the core value process is called the deep dive process. Now, the deep dive takes the value drivers that have been identified in the Discover and goes much deeper into the company as far as what <clears throat> what exactly is needed to be able to capture that value gap and increase the value of the company. It also prioritizes and tracks the progress that the value consultant and the business owner achieves as they go through the process of fixing and correcting these particular opportunities. Uh, fabulous, fabulous package. Uh, there's another process that's been developed um, by me, um, and it's called the Value Improvement Program, and that's available in pocketexperts.solutions. It is a series of questionnaires and webinars that focus the business owner and the value growth consultant on opportunities to increase value. Uh, there is 53 topics within this particular program and 53 webinars. And over the process, uh, as you look at different subject areas, you have the access to uh, approximately 130 experts, subject area experts that can help the business owner and the valuation expert <coughs> implement the plan to improve the value of the business. So. On one hand, we've got software that is world-class in assessing the value drivers and the opportunity. <coughs> and then on the other hand, we have a process that um, will tell you how to fix it. And it will also provide you access to about 130 and growing experts across the world. Um, these two can be used in conjunction. So you could you could combine the core value and the value improvement program, <coughs> achieving great results by 
using the core value to do the assessment and the value improvement program to actually implement the plan. Um, great tools available for both the business owner as well as the consultant. Because I think that part of this process, and you alluded to it at the beginning, is that business owners will come to some point in their business continuum, right? And it's, and now with like coming out of the pandemic and things like that, I think that business owners are sitting back and saying, okay, do I want to work for another five years? And what, like, what value could I get to sell? And am I okay with that? What would be entailed in doing that? And do I want to do that? And then depending upon the difference, I've seen some clients that are like, you know what, maybe it is a good time to sell um, or gift to children in the business. Or you know what, it's worth it for me to work that three to five years more to get that more money that I could sell so that I could really have everything for retirement. So those are a lot of the decisions that are happening right now. And these tools give you a more concrete way to think about that process, basically, right? Right. And what what happens, I think you've probably experienced this, Melissa, is um, we go in to value a company. Uh, let's say it's for litigation or tax purposes. Um, and <clears throat> we go in and, and we determine the value of the company is $3 million. And the business owner looks at us and wants to throw us out of the building and tell us to leave the parking lot, right? Because the business owner says, you're insulting me. Our business is worth $6 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we have a, a gap between what the business is really worth and what the business owner thinks the business is worth. Okay. Now let's assume that what the business owner thinks the business is worth is determined based on what they need it to be worth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they have they have maybe uh, taken an analysis and said, if I can sell for six, pay my taxes, <clears throat> I'll have four million left. If I invest that at five percent, it'll generate X, and I can live the rest of my life the way I live it now, and everything's going to be great. Maybe that's how they came up with the six. That's what they need. Okay. The other thing they may have done is they talked to their buddy uh, out in, uh, let's say, Missouri, since we're here in Missouri. Okay. And they sold their business at five times EBITDA. <coughs> and so they're sitting there going, well, then I should get five times EBITDA for my business. Well, that is not necessary. As you know, Melissa, that is not necessarily apples and apples. It's sort of apples and oranges, right? Right. Exactly. Excuse me. So um, if we have an opportunity to go in today, and if we have an opportunity to say, you know, your business is really worth $3 million, you need it to be worth six. Mm-hmm. How much time do we have between today and then? Mm -hmm. Is that two years, three years, four years, five years? What is it? You know, what's our runway? And then if we take that runway, can we get it to six? Can we get it to seven? And that is the process that we're going to go through. Um, if they wait, if they wait five years and they earn some more money, they spend some more money, right? Um, <clears throat> and they get to the end of five years. And now you go in and do the valuation and it's worth 2.5 million. Mm -hmm. It went down in value. Right. They didn't even know it was going down in value. They needed six. Now we're five years later and now it's worth less. So, so this process is really designed to not only grow value, but to monitor value each year and to be able to say, are we on track? Are we going forward in the right direction? Are we making the right decisions? This is a 
ongoing process that's monitored quarterly. And, and we're in a position where we reset the values every year. <coughs> and the overall outcome is the business owner ends up with the goal they expect and they maximize the value of their of their uh, ownership. You know, the, the, the next part of this presentation is, <clears throat> well, how much does it cost and how long does it take? Um, this project is, is one where um, if we were to do this, um, the best way we could possibly do it, it would be probably about a five-year project. That's going to spread cost out over a five-year period of time, and we're going to gain value along the way. So it, it produces the greatest results for the lowest cost. And um, it, it, sometimes that's just not possible because the runway that we have available in, in a particular business may be much shorter. Maybe there's only three years that uh, is left or maybe two years that's left and, and that the business owner wants out at a much quicker pace. Um, in, in those particular situations, we may not be able to capture all of the benefits that, that are available, but we certainly could focus in on the ones that are what I refer to as low-hanging fruit and also the ones that's going to give the, the largest increase in value for the effort. Um, this thing could be structured in such a way that it, it spreads it out over um, a period of time, <clears throat> taking two or three objectives per year, um, spreading those costs out as well as the time it takes to implement um, and the amount of time your staff is required to assist, <clears throat> and could be structured in such a way that it's, it's a four-hour monthly consulting uh, directing the staff on changes that are required and then coming back each month to review progress. Um, all of the uh, uh, implementation of the program is all based on measured benefits. You know, are there some changes the company can do to generate immediate increase in value? So we're going to come out of today's program at least understanding that there are a few uh, let's say low hanging fruit that all of us can take advantage of through today's program. <clears throat> and the quickest and easiest increase in value is achieved through the reduction in risk. So the, the basic formula for valuation is a uh, benefit stream divided by risk. Now, benefit stream for most of us um, is measured as cash flows that are available to the investor, the owner of the business. <clears throat> Risk is defined as the expected return on that investment based on the level of risk of achieving those returns that are expected in the future. <clears throat> if we can in if we can decrease the risk uh, 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 in a particular business, then our formula is going to generate a much higher value for the same level of cash flow. So many, many individuals that own businesses, the first thing they think of to increase value is to increase cash flow. Hmm. Granted, a great idea, much harder to do. And, and uh, one of the easiest things to do almost immediately is to decrease risk to the extent that we can um, have a much lower risk of achieving those future cash flows, uh, then we certainly are going to increase the value significantly. And if we look at the valuation formula slightly different and we say, you know, what is, what makes up value? There, there's two basic components to value. Uh, the first one is the tangible assets. And if you can hear, um, you could advance. Yep, there you go. Um, 
the first is the tangible assets, and then the second is the intangible assets. And if you add those two together, obviously you get the value of the business. Well, what what a lot of people that own businesses understand is the value of the tangible assets. The, you know, it's the equipment, um, it's the receivables, it's the inventory, um, it's the things that we can see and touch. Um, and so from a standpoint of maximizing the value of the tangible assets, there are certain actions we can take, and, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> the intangible assets are a whole other issue. And if you think about this formula, tangible assets plus intangible assets, if we got zero for the intangible assets, well, then the value of the business would only be whatever it could be liquidated for. So in order for us to maximize the value, we've really got to maximize the value of the intangible assets, which is goodwill and, and many other intangibles. In order to do that, there's a word that you should think about 24-7. It's called transferability. So if I made a list of all the intangible assets of your business and I went down each item on that list, <clears throat> the question I would be asking is whether or not you could transfer that particular asset to a buyer. Um, and to the extent that we can protect, document, and transfer intangible assets to a buyer, we're going to increase value. Um, and so that's a very simple and easy way to be able to um, increase the value in a short term. So if we look at if we look at the first part of that formula, which is <clears throat> tangible assets, the question would be what action can can we take as a business owner to assure that the tangible assets are protected and transferable? Well, that sounds so easy, but yet what happens in a lot of transactions that I get involved in is when we get down towards the closing and we're doing the due diligence between the buyer and the seller, it is amazing how often we find tangible assets that are not owned by the business. They're on the books and records of the business. They appear on the financial statement of the business. Everybody thinks the business owns the assets, but in reality, the business doesn't own the asset. So when that happens, then there's a, the, the seller, you, the business owner, are in a very vulnerable position. You're now having to secure the ownership of that so you can transfer it to the buyer for a, a value, fair market value, as of the date of sale, but you don't own it. And it puts you in a very vulnerable position and may end up having to give up some of that price <clears throat> to the true owner in order to be able to transfer the asset. <coughs> so a very simple process, very easy, is to verify the title of all trans of all tangible assets, real estate, vehicles, machinery. Um, this may sound like a waste of time. It, it really isn't because, you know, did you ever see that commercial where <clears throat> I think it was uh, Fram oil filters, if I remember right. And the, the commercial was something like you could pay me now or pay me later. <clears throat> right. Well, this type of a process of verifying the tangible assets, it, it will be done at closing, whether you do it now or whether you do it then. It's much better to do it now because <clears throat> you have the time and the uh, benefit of making sure that you maximize the value by doing it now. Uh, when you do it at closing, you have no flexibility whatsoever. Um, and you want to make sure that that you maintain the physical assets, the values going forward, which requires physical observation of those tangible assets uh, routinely. And 
making sure that you perfect the title of those assets. Um, Melissa, are you back with us? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, how often, Melissa, have you run into a situation where <clears throat> you, you're doing evaluation and, and you look at the balance sheet, it's got a building on the balance sheet. And then when you start to do the valuation and you start looking at the title, you realize the company doesn't own the building. It, mm -hmm. It's actually owned by another person. <clears throat> and somebody in their infinite wisdom, somewhere along the line, said, well, just put the building on the company and we'll put the mortgage on the company, even though the company doesn't owe the mortgage. And instead of paying rent, we'll just make the mortgage payment. <clears throat> it's those crazy things that you see that make sale transactions extremely difficult. And that's why uh, we go through this process of perfecting the um, title of all assets before we do a closing. Um, so this is a better process to do up front as opposed to waiting till you actually sell. Well, and I think the benefit of working with somebody who understands valuations and understands the process of selling a company <clears throat> is that some of those things that can really um, slow the process at the end or yes. when you're closing, not understanding how your assets are titled, um, not understanding certain specifics of the operations, um, does start to maybe ding the price because there's this confusion. Like, how do you know? Are you misleading us? Are you tricking us? You know, and it's like, well, maybe I just didn't know it. Um, it also, in an auction style process, you know, if you don't know some of the answers to some of these questions that they lodge at you about your financials, it becomes apparent that they're the only ones that are looking at this company. And so I think working with somebody like you, that's a consultant, but also a valuation person is really helpful because you're going to understand more about the process of selling your company. And I feel like that's where people get a little stuck when they actually go to sell their company. It's like, oh, I didn't know that that was going to mess things up. Well, you know, you would already give that advice a year, two, three years ahead of time. Things right. can be cleaned up. If if somebody needs to do like actual reviewed statements, accounting right. statements, they right. could get that done and have a three year track record for when right. they go to sell. You know, a lot of these things can be found out, but a business owner wouldn't necessarily know them going in, you know, up front, whereas a consultant could come in and say, oh, here's a list of things you need to be concerned about. Um, and I think that that really increases the sale price as well. You know, oh, a sophisticated is. seller mm -hmm. is going to be really good for sophisticated buyers. And most buyers are sophisticated buyers, you know? That's correct. I mean, all the points you just said are absolutely right on. And um, when, when we go through the process of selling a business, um, the better the accounting is, the higher the level of the outside accounting, including audit, um, increases value mm -hmm. because it lends credibility to the overall numbers that the buyer is relying upon in order to make their decision of how much they're going to pay. <clears throat> to the extent that they ask for information, they're going to ask for everything. Mm -hmm. you, you, you won't believe how much they're going to ask for. And when they ask for it, if it takes more than a day to get it, you're already making a problem as to the credibility of the information. Mm -hmm. They're expecting instant access because if you're organized and, and you've got good systems in place, you should be able to generate that in a, in a matter of seconds. You are absolutely right, Melissa. That is what happens. And then they start to get concerned over the numbers. They start to get concerned over the value. And before you know it, you're negotiating the price. Well, let's let's just jump into uh, the next item. And that is how does the business 
transfer ownership of an intangible asset. <clears throat> um, the the first process of that, and and let's let's try to put this in in the um, in per perspective. Um, if the tangible, let's say your business, uh, your tangible assets, your business are worth a million five. Um, the intangible assets of your business are probably worth two and a half million. Okay. So we got 1.5 million plus two and a half million. I mean, we're looking at $4 million of value. The majority of that happens to be intangible assets. Um, so that you got to ask this, you got to ask yourself the question, are your intangible assets protected and are they transferable? If, if the answer is, I don't know, you're putting at jeopardy the majority of the value of your business. <clears throat> if the answer is, I don't think they are, then you're putting at jeopardy all of the intangible value. Because at closing, which now we don't have any time left <coughs> to fix the problems, at closing, the buyer is going to expect you to serve up those intangible assets, to be able to transfer that goodwill, the, the know-how, the operational process, the, the, in, um, the workforce in, in force, um, the operations, et cetera. They're, they're going to expect you to transfer that to the buyer. To the extent that you cannot do that at closing, then either one, the price is going to be negotiated down or the price is going to be deferred and the payment's going to be deferred until there is some comfort from the buyer standpoint that they were able to achieve that value. So to the extent we can focus immediately on the intangible assets, which is in the example I gave you, the largest portion of the total value, well then now way in advance of any type of sale, we're starting to protect the value of the intangible assets. <clears throat> Let's just sort of put this into perspective again. What, what are these intangible assets? Uh, um, the customer relationships, the manufacturer production know-how, patents, operational procedures, customer expectations and exceptions, supplier relationships, in-place workforce, trade secrets, um, logo, the uh, telephone number, the trademarks, etc. Um, and, and many of the valuators or business owners group, a group all of this into one title and they call it goodwill. And um, so to the extent we can identify these intangible assets, make a list, to then we can look at who owns this. I mean, can you imagine um, that the patent that generates the bulk of your revenue is actually owned by someone other than the company. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so now you're going to transfer that patent at closing and the company doesn't own it. Well, what is the person that owns that patent going to want at closing when you go to them and say, transfer the title uh, money, I would suspect. Okay. Right. Let, let's get that up. Let's get that resolved right up front. Let's say that, over the years, you've grown the business quite a bit, and <clears throat> the customer relationships have really <clears throat> slipped through your hands, and they've been delegated down to salespeople and sales managers, and you just don't have um, the one-on-one -on -one relationship with all the customers. And so now you're at a point of having to sell the business. The buyer's going to say, are you going to be able to retain this business with these customers. And the first thing you're going to say is, well, I don't even know who they are. Okay. Do you see the disconnect? So <clears throat> to the extent that we can <coughs> get in place, non-competes, non-solicitation and confidentiality agreements with 
all of our key people and all of our employees. We can start documenting the relationship. We can start documenting the process. We can document the operational policies and procedures and the know-how, and we can maintain that in a secure location and update it frequently. We're in a position that we can actually transfer that asset to a buyer with some comfort that it's going to be transferable. Um, these are fairly easy, um, actionable items that can be done quickly, and they're easier to do today, even though you don't like confrontation, and you don't like going to somebody and saying, sign this document, and you're worried they might quit. Hey, hey, I'd rather have them quit now, okay, right. than quit one day before closing and kill the deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so to the extent that um, this is one of those areas, we have a better leverage right now to be able to negotiate. If we need to pay a little bit of money, a little bit more in salary, <coughs> maybe give a little bit of ownership to get somebody to sign. Hey, it's, it's, it's worth at least considering what do we need to do to get this done? Mm -hmm. Then we protect it, Melissa. We protect it, protect it, protect it going forward. Well, and, yeah. and one thing that I think is interesting in this process is that it does give the business owner a better concept of what a purchase price would be and what is involved. Because another thing that we're seeing is transactions where buyers right now and ever are approaching successful businesses to purchase them. So we're having a reverse thing happen that somebody just comes out of the blue and they might be a perfect buyer. And so then you need to ramp up. Well, if you're already ramped up, then you're ready yeah. to go. Right. Right. And the longer that due diligence goes on, the more risk you have on the price. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 I've been through so much transactional work. Uh, it's the bulk of what I do now. And um, we, we really don't want that due diligence to go much more than 90 days. Mm -hmm. If it starts to drift into three months, six months, nine months, um, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And I think that the other thing is that, you know, just conceptually for business owners. So a buyer comes to you or a competitor or some, somebody that you know, and they're like, oh, come on, like, what would you sell it for? Well, what would you sell for? Now, in the example that we've talked about, if that buyer is like, well, I don't know, maybe I'd sell it for six million. And the the or the seller says that, and the buyer is like, six million? What the hell? You know, you've already pushed somebody off by just spouting out a number that you like kind of thought was rational that had no basis in reality. Right. And you could have pushed off somebody. You know, that's like me saying, oh, I want to go buy this car. And they're like, oh, it's 100000 I was like, nope, don't want that car. And they're like, oh, I made a mistake. It's 20000 And you're like, what's wrong with the car? <laughs> right? And right. that's the same. Like, I don't think that, that companies right. understand that that is the same process that goes through the head of the buyer. And, and quite frankly, you should never tell them a number ever. No, no. Ever. No. <laughs> I mean, we're in an ideal world, uh, one buyer is as bad as having no buyers, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so to the extent we can create a competitive environment with multiple buyers, we're going to have the biggest uh, and most success. So maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. But that's mm -hmm. at least the, the direction we'd like to go in. <clears throat> and buyers always want to know, well, what's your asking price? Well, um, we would prefer that uh, we give them the information. They come back with an offer. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't always work, but it it is at least the strategy we'd like to start with. Well, and I think some of the framework, because we do a lot of the same process, is like, why don't you give them that five-year summary of the financials, your income statement and balance sheet, and even sometimes we'll do it in a real sh condensed format. So we're not giving all the details. We're not giving tax returns. You know, get them to come forward. And we're running those adjusted numbers through yes. a evaluation model so we know where they should come and then really if they come 
hi much higher. Okay, great. If they come much lower, like, you know, we, like we have to have a reference point. And so I think that that's yeah. another piece of it. Um, and then a lot of it's negotiation and it's hard to negotiate when you only have, you know, like it's hard to play poker with your own money. Um, and, and that's where you really do need advisors to help you with that process to negotiate that purchase price. Um, but I, it's, it's not just saying, I, I, I like to tell people, well, if you throw out a number, you've basically created the highest number anybody's going to give you. You will never get higher than that number. Right. And whereas if you just give them the information, assume that the buyer is smart, right? Assume that they're smart and that they can come up with the best number with those financials, maybe they'll come higher because that's the strategic value of the company. And the whole purpose is that if somebody has some more knowledge of your field and could take your services or products and put them right into their own company, they could pay more for it they than could. what you've looked at. Exactly right. You know, I like the story where I was, in, I was engaged by a, a potential buyer in an auction. And um, the way the auction worked is there was a data room and um, you were first qualified as a buyer. And once we got through the qualification, then we could make a reservation to go into the data room and spend as much time as we want. And then we would formulate our offer and then we would send it in as a bid. Right. Um, and I remember sitting down with the buyer, uh, my client, and, and saying, here's what I think the price is. And I can remember the client saying, well, no, we need to up that price. And I said, well, what are you, crazy? I mean, it's worth uh, $10 million. And they said, well, we won't get it at 10. And I said, well, how do you know you won't get it at 10? He says, I just know I won't get it at 10. We got to go 11 million. And, and I remember this conversation and the dialogue that was going on, and it was all driven by the process itself. It wasn't, you know, it had nothing to do with the fact of what the numbers were. It had a lot to do with that there was a perception that this was going to get bid up. And the reality, Melissa, they didn't get the bid. It hmm. sold for much higher than that. Uh, it, it is a process that is driven by mm, synergies and emotions and who are the buyers. And you can definitely maximize value if you can create that environment. Yeah. And some people, you know, I think that there's a lot of ways to sell your company. Some people are like, you know, I've identified somebody I think is a good cultural fit. Um, I want to work with them. I want to transition to them, I, you know, because the reality is at the end of the day, the transaction, everybody thinks it's all about the purchase price. And I try to tell sellers this all the time, like, it's not going to be about the price at some point. It's going to be about your legacy, your people, yourself, and all of that comes into play. Um, but I think that even going through the process, because most of the time when you do that three to five year look back, you're asking questions like, well, what happened to this bad debt in 2018? And they're right. like, I don't know. And they have to go ask the questions. So all we're doing is asking the questions before a buyer is going to ask them as well. And then you know the answer. Now they, if somebody asks that question, they say, oh yeah, so uh, that particular client didn't pay us, blah, blah, blah. And, and you have it immediately. That is a more, it seems like a more intelligent seller. It seems like a more knowledgeable seller. They know their finances in and out. That's right. more likely to get a higher price as well because right. they think that it is a very efficient, effective system. Well you know? managed company, yes, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the the viewers today, if they could, if they could walk away from today's program, understanding that that these small issues that we're talking about are really quite critical, mm -hmm. and and the more you can spend time on them now, the better you can do your accounting today. The higher you can make that level of outside accounting, 
the more value you're going to add down the road. You can't wait to the last minute to do this. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And because when you wait to the last minute, you literally want it sold tomorrow. And that's, you know, a very difficult, then you're, you could sometimes make decisions that are not thought out, don't have some logic in them, because they're just like, I, 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 you know, whatever, because also health concerns pop up in business owners. And that's a surprise sometimes, right? And, you know, that does add a layer of complexity when you're selling a company. So, you know, again, being prepared, everybody's like, oh, prepare three to five years in advance. And I think business owners are like, that seems like a good ploy by the consultants. No, it really is. You, It's not that you have one chance to make a really good, but you have one chance to make a really good sale in your business and to convert it. And this is probably the biggest transaction you would do in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to sell this business for $3 million, but we really had the opportunity to sell it for six. Really, did we really make a mistake by not getting on top of this now? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I mean, that is really what we're talking about. And I, it doesn't matter to me. I got plenty of work. Right. Uh, um, you know, whether I, whether uh, I help or someone else helps, hopefully someone right. else will. Um, and the, the the opportunity is there for the business owner and for the valuation consultant to be able to make a difference mm -hmm. and to be able to generate a much higher price if they get on top of it now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and why don't we take, because I think that this has been amazing information, um, really good advice, but tell us a little bit more about you and value defined and kind of how you can help um, clients and we'll show some ways that they can reach out to you as well. Well, um, value defined is a valuation firm that deals with business valuation, litigation support and merger and acquisition transactions. Um, my history is in public accounting. I started in a local firm in the Toledo area, grew that up to uh, 26 professionals. I left there, went to work in a, um, a business that um, I was second in command and the owner that I worked with, she was absolutely the most brilliant person I've ever met. We grew that business 35% a year for two years and went into three states ultimately sold that business to a fortune 500 company. So I learned a lot about not only public practice, but also the business. Then I started a sole proprietor, just myself and my wife and built that up to 28 people. <clears throat> uh, and, and during that phase of the career, I became certified in business valuation, started to do, Valuation, litigation, M&A transactions, you pretty much name it. Um, I've known Melissa for a long time and she knows pretty much what, what I know and what I can do. So <clears throat> then I left there, started again. It's like, you know, the big issue here is I don't like partners. So, <laughs> so we got we to gotta make it very clear. <laughs> Why is this guy changing all the time? Uh, right. I can't get along with anybody. Uh, so started another firm, grew it up to, we had about six people. And um, I had a partner that was going to take over. Really neat guy. I think you've met him, uh, Melissa, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. And uh, decided, well, I'm producing 80% of the work. How's he going to buy me out? It, it just wasn't in the cards. So we sold to a local firm, 40 plus person firm that later sold to GBQ which mm -hmm. is in the top 100. And so over the career, I've had opportunities uh, hooked up with an investment banker out of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> we together formed the Business Growth Alliance. Uh, he is a brilliant investment banker. He's currently heads up the wealth uh, management uh, department of Ernst & Young. <coughs> Guys, 
phenomenal. Uh, his name is Jim Bly. And um, so what, what we're able to do in the business valuation community is leverage our, our resources with others. So sort of a collaborative effect. Right? And that's what we're doing now with the pocket experts. So that instead of having overhead, which, you know, I don't like overhead, you still have access to the resources, but right. you're not having to pay for those every day. That's mm -hmm. basically what I've done over the years. Um, and that's sort of the, my story. Yeah. Well, I love it. So we, we showed, uh, you know, various ways that they could reach out to you and I appreciate all of your intelligent, uh, remarks today, even with some of our technical di difficulties. Oh no big God. deal. Yeah, there's a uh, thunderstorm, I guess, in Missouri right now, right? It's, it's was... literally like black outside. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sunny here, by the way. So, uh, that's the benefits of living in Missouri, although Ohio, you know, kind of similar. So it's very similar, very <laughs> similar, but not today. Today right. it's gorgeous. But well, we, we got appreciate through. it. Yeah. Well, thanks, Garth. And we'll probably have you on again when we have like perfect scenario, but we'll try. <laughs> Better weather. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.